Children of God, welcome. Welcome to this place of love and grace. Welcome to this place of hope and perseverance. God invites all of us to be a part of his beloved community, and God invites all of us to share in the good news. We are welcome, just as we are, and we are loved, just as we are. In gratitude of all of this, let us worship our great God. Our hymn of praise this morning is going to be number 28, Let All the World in Every Corner Sing. I will point out that on the uh, second line, towards the end of the second line, the word thither is, uh, is in this hymn, so don't let that trip you up when we get there. If you will, please stand and sing as we sing Let All the World in Every Corner Sing, number 28. Christian Church. If, can you smell it already? The pizza? Did you smell it when you came in? It is a wonderful smell, and the closer you get to that end of the building, the better it gets. So do not forget that you're not cooking lunch. You're not going to go get lunch anywhere else. We're going to all head down the hall at 11 a.m. to the fellowship dinner where we will be celebrating going back to school. The cost is $8 for adults, five for children, 30 for family. Uh, monetary donations will be collected, or if, even if you have school supplies, we're collecting all that for Ridge Road Elementary. So we hope to see you right after this service. The Disciples Men have another wonderful program planned for Tuesday. It will be at 6 p.m. in Grace Hall, and they are welcoming the speaker, Carrie Bradburn. He is the author of the book, On the Opposite Shore, The Making of North Iraq. So it's one you don't want to miss. So please reserve a spot. You can call Robin at the church office at 501-753-1109 or call James. So if he hadn't already talked to you, because <laughs> he, he, he won't let you get past. I love it. And likewise, just as our men always play, plan wonderful uh, programs, so do our disciples women. And September, they are supporting the pantry, and if we want to help in that venue, dry pasta, peanut butter, and cereal are much needed. Their next meeting is October 13th at 10 a.m. in the parlor. Linda White will lead a study, and Rebecca Meat will lead worship, so that'll be wonderful. Grief Share continues on Mondays in the parlor at 5.30 uh, under the loving and welcoming arms of Janet Speaks. If you know of anybody that would benefit from that program, you know, every single Monday stands alone. You don't have to go the whole time. Um, they'll be right at home. The youth continue to hope that you will give them a call so that they can rake your leaves or get your Christmas decorations down, so don't forget that. You can call the church office to make those arrangements. And I'm really happy to say 
that the fall festival is in the works. So October 23rd, and I've heard some great rumblings about maybe a chili cook-off. So it should be real interesting. And so don't forget to tell your neighbors and friends because that's fun for all ages. And let us continue our worship. All right, our hymn of devotion this morning is number 295. We'll sing verses 1 and 3 of Near to the Heart of God. Uh, then we'll have our morning prayer this morning and sing verse 1 again. on our prayer list this morning. You can find that in our bulletin if you want to look over those names. Or just gather folks on your heart um, that you know of that need prayer, either prayers of joy or prayers of comfort and peace. And we're going to take all of that to God together this morning. Oh God, who always listens to us, who breathes new life into us, give us strength for our daily living. We are surrounded by a world of dry bones, a world of death and despair, a world where we lose hope in our structures, ourselves, and in you. We pray for this world in need of your word, for all the people in it, for those who lay down their lives, and for those who leave. God, who always listens to us, who breathes new life into us, give us strength for our daily living. We are surrounded by people with dried up lives, people unable to see your life past their tears, and we pray for this world in need of your healing presence. For those who are imprisoned or alone, those ill or grieving, and we especially pray for those in our congregation in this time, grieving a loss, dealing with injury and illness, struggling with depression and anxiety, or with fear and loneliness. O oh God, who always listens, who breathes new life into us, give us renewed strength for our daily living. Call us to follow in the footsteps of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Help us to continue the ministry you have called us to and dream new dreams of ways we can serve and connect with our community and world. Inspire newness of life within us and give us hope and purpose for a better today and tomorrow, loving God. Give us strength for our daily living. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And on this communion table, those same words are there. On every communion table, I would say, within the city of Little Rock that you would want to go to, those words in remembrance of me, of me are there. And as we come to this place today, and as we come to this time of service today, we come in remembrance of Christ. We come to remember what he has done for us. We come to remember his death, but we also come to remember more than that. We come to remember his life. We come to remember that it is at this place and at this time where we gather together as the body of Christ that we come into the spiritual presence of Christ who joins us at this table. It is at this table that we participate in the body of Christ, that we participate in the life of Christ. So come to the table. Come to the table and participate in remembrance of all that Christ has done for us. Our hymn of preparation this morning is number 376. We'll sing verses 1 and 3 of We Meet Within This Holy Place. Thank you. 
us pray. God, who is always faithful in the big and the small things, we thank you that Jesus came to show us how to live a life of faithfulness in you. We especially thank you that he gave his life in faithful witness to you so that we can come to you now without fear of our own sin or of death. And now as we take these reminders of all Jesus gave us, fill us again with your spirit that we too can live out our faithfulness in big and small ways so that others could know of your love for them. We pray it in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen. When the Apostle Paul wanted to remind people in the city of Corinth that when they came to the table of the Lord, they were coming in unity with one another and as the body of Christ, he took them to the table and he said, for I received from the Lord what it is I pass along to you, that on the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took a piece of bread and he ripped it in two. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That night, after supper, he took a cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. This is my life that I'm pouring out for you. Keep on doing this in remembrance of me. And then the apostle reminded them, and he reminds us, that as often as we eat this bread together, as often as we drink from this cup together, we are together proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes.
saying to her already. Why <laughs> 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 Thank you for that choir. That, that was uh, that was something. Thank you. You know, all summer long, the traditional readings that we've been going to, and the gospel readings anyway, have taken us to the book of Luke. And we've been what commentators call on a journey, journey to Jerusalem. And it's not a, it's not a trip that Luke takes us to that we can map out on a map and with geography, but he takes us on a journey about what it means to be a disciple and what Jesus is saying to his disciples and to other people along the way. And he takes us to different places and he takes us to a really different place today. If you wanna follow along, the reading comes from Luke, the 16th chapter, verses one through 13, and that is found page 96 of the New Testament in your pew Bibles, verses one through 13, and Luke puts it this way. Then Jesus said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly for the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The parable of the dishonest, ma- of the dishonest manager is found only in the Gospel of Luke. It's not found in any other Gospel. And Luke tells us that Jesus told this parable to his disciples. He wasn't talking to the crowd. He wasn't talking to others who might have been coming along. He was talking to his disciples. And when he talks to his disciples throughout all of Luke on this journey, He talks to them about the kingdom of God. He talks to them about the values that disciples ought to have when it comes to the kingdom of God, how they ought to live in this world in anticipation of the coming of that kingdom. But I don't know about you, but for me, this parable, if he's talking to a disciple, if he's talking to me, it seems a little bit out of joint. Seems that it bothers me a little bit anyway. And I think this parable can bother us. I think this parable can bother us because we like our stories to make sense. We want the good guys to win and the bad guys to lose. And we want our parables to be that way too. 
But in this parable, a dishonest person, a dishonest manager steals and squanders his master's property. Then when he's found out about it and knows he's going to be fired for it, before he's out the door, before he can clear out of his desk, he steals from his master again. He calls people in who owe his master money. And he says, how much do you owe? And he cuts the bill for one and a half. How much do you owe to another? And he cuts the bill down from what he owed. And it goes on and on this way. And at the end, when his master finds out about it, his master commends him for it. And Jesus says, the moral of this story is this. The children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. You know, people down through the centuries have been troubled by this parable. Some commentators are so troubled by it that they try to clean it up a, a bit. What they say is it's not really the servant that was dishonest, it was the master that was dishonest. The master was overcharging, the master was charging too much interest, the master was charging interest in violation of the law of Moses to people. And so when the servant was fired from his job, he acted honestly and called in all of those who had been overcharged and who had been given too much interest and he cut it down to what it should have been. And the moral of the story, they say, these commentators who try to clean this story up a bit say, is that if you act honestly, Jesus is saying, act honestly with wealth, and in the end, it'll come out all right. And I think they try to make us say that because this parable is hard to wrestle with. Because Jesus seems, if we read this parable, to be commending dishonest behavior. But I suspect that what Jesus meant in this parable is exactly what it sounds like. Jesus used an example of a dishonest person, a dishonest servant, to make the point that people in this world use money and the loyalties money can buy in order to make a way for themselves. You know, all through the Gospels, Jesus speaks about money in this way. In some places, in the language in which Luke wrote, he calls it dis unrighteous mammon or dishonest mammon. And what that means is there's an unrighteousness connected with wealth and possessions. Money and possessions can be a corrupting influence. We think about money when we devote all of our time and attention to thinking about money, we think about money as a way to enrich ourselves. When we use our time and our energy to think about money, we think about money in ways of gaining more for ourselves. We, if we think this way, don't, use, don't think about how we can use it for the benefit of others. It's always been that way. What this dishonest, dishonest manager did is nothing more than what we see around us all the time. No one, is shrewd, no one who's shrewd and knows how the system works ever seems to pay a price. They never seem to take an economic hit, do they? They know how to use money, and they know how to make friends with the use of money so that when tough times come or when trouble comes, they're able to find a way out of it. That's the way it works. That's the way it always works. And we don't have to think too far back to remember 2008 when we had the economic and the housing collapse that was brought about by people who were bundling derivatives, using people's, other people's money, bundling bad debt with good debt and selling it at a profit. And when the economy came tumbling down as a result of it, they didn't suffer. The people who lost money suffered, but they never suffered because they had used money and they had used connections 
to find a new home in another brokerage company. They had used money and they had used connections to get a bailout because they had made friends with the right people and had used wealth in a way that looked out for themselves. So the dishonest manager said, what shall I do? I'm too old to dig and I'm too proud to beg. What will I do? This is what I'll do. I'll use money to buy friends so that when my master fires me, they will welcome me into their homes. And Jesus said, make friends for yourselves with dishonest wealth so that you might be welcomed into eternal homes. So what is Jesus saying? What is this parable about? Is Jesus really saying that dishonesty pays off in the end? You know, I don't think that's the lesson of this parable. I think Jesus is trying to make a point, and he's trying to make a point to his disciples to whom he spoke it, and he's trying to make a point to us today. But we have a hard time understanding it unless we chew on it a little bit. You see, Jesus didn't commend this dishonest servant. His master did. And his master didn't commend the servant for being dishonest. He commended the servant for being shrewd and having foresight. What the master in this parable said is sometimes what we say about people that we don't really have a lot of respect for, but people who always seem to come out in the end. You know, it's like saying, how many times have we said, well, you've got to hand it to him. He really knows how to play the game. I think the point of this parable that Jesus is telling us is to have the same foresight for eternal things as this dishonest servant had for temporary things. Jesus said, look at this guy. He was shrewd with his position. He was shrewd with his time and with money. He focused on the future and finding a way to be welcomed into another home. You should be as shrewd and have that same kind of foresight, Jesus is saying, but you're children of light. Your future is different. Be shrewd with your time and money and resources so that you can be welcomed into the eternal homes. So what does this kind of shrewdness look like? It's not a perfect illustration, but I'd like to tell you a story. Last week, I went home and in the afternoon, I sat down and I looked at my Facebook page and I saw that someone had posted something on uh, Facebook about a man in Runnels, Iowa, who had passed away six years ago last Sunday. Runnels is a small town in Iowa. It's a small town that's about 20 miles to the southeast of downtown Des Moines. But a shrewd man lived in Runnels. His name was Carl Mott. Carl was unique. Carl was 30 years older than I was. He had served in World War II during war in the Navy, and he had come back to Runnels to build a family and to build a life. He was sort of an institution in Runnels. Everybody knew Carl. Everybody had a story about Carl. Most of those stories had to do with laughter. Most of those stories had to do with teasing. When I knew him, about seven years ago, his knees were bothering him, so he walked with a cane, and he could be wicked with that cane. But Carl was always doing things that brought a smile to someone's face. He was always there when someone needed something. The stories that people told, though, were mostly about Carl's love for the church, Carl's love for God. Because Carl's values were those. 
His values were those that were connected with church and connected with God. At a very early age, he told me that he had decided that he was going to give 10% of everything he had to the church. He never had much, but whatever he had, he always gave 10%. He was an authentic person who was constantly trying to do what God wanted, wanted him to do in this world. Carl never ran for public office, but he was elected mayor of Runnels three times on write-ins. And in, back in those days, the mayor of the town also served as the municipal judge for the violation of municipal ordinances, and Carl served as a municipal judge. And there was a young man in town, he was young at the time, and he kept getting into trouble, and he was on his way to being trouble. And he finally came before Carl, and Carl sentenced this young man to a year in Sunday school. Right down the Christian church, right down the road, he said, and I know whether you're there or not because I'm there every week. One day I met this young man in the park at the church, at the time the church was having something in the park and someone pointed out to me that that's the guy Carl sentenced to Sunday school for a year. So I went over and I introduced myself and I talked to him and I said, so you're the guy that Carl sentenced to Sunday school. And he grinned and he said, yep. And then he said, in all seriousness, I don't know what would have happened to me if it hadn't have been for Carl. In his last years of his life, Carl lived across from the senior center and he would go across and eat dinner there every day. He called it the Silly Center. And he would always go in there and he would sit around and he would talk with people and always, always, he would invite them or encourage them to go to church. He would talk to them about the things of God. He worried about people and he would pray for people. One time he told me there was a time in my life that I had to go home and watch my favorite religious program at 1.30. I had to leave early to do that, but I had to do it. He said, I didn't know you could get hungry for it, but I was hungry for it. One day, about a little over six years ago, his grandson sent me a note, an email, and he says, Grandpa's in hospice. Just thought you would like to know. I was out of town that week, but when I got back, I went to the hospice. And I walked into his room and I found Carl with one foot in this life and one foot in the next. His grandson and his grandson's wife were there and we started talking and remembering some things about Carl and there are strange things happen at times like this. As we were talking, all of a sudden, Carl opened his eyes. He had his hearing aids in, but I didn't know if he heard what we were saying. And his eyes were open, but I didn't know if he was focused. His grandson said he was absolutely convinced that Carl heard what we had to say. So we went over and we gathered around Carl and we thank God for Carl's life. And we reminded God of some things. We reminded God that Carl had lived his life with a concern for others. We reminded God that Carl had lived his life with a love for his church, for God's church, that Carl had lived his life with a love for God and the things of God and we ask God to welcome Carl into eternal habitations. And about five minutes later, the doors open to Carl's new eternal home. So it turns out that this parable that Jesus told isn't about praising the dishonest servant at all. It's about being shrewd concerning eternal habitations. 
It's about being as shrewd for eternal habitations as this manager was shrewd in finding a new home with dishonest wealth and in a dishonest way. And being shrewd with eternal habitations is the reason we give to this church. It's the reason we tithe to the church. It's a reason we make pledges to the church. Because this church reaches out in need to those who are in this community. And it reaches out when we are in need as a community of faith. You see, the church is the only organization on the face of the earth that proclaims the kingdom of God and the saving grace of God in Jesus Christ. It's the only organization that speaks of the way of God to people that can spiritually heal us and transform our lives. And I want to tell you, lives are being touched here. We don't celebrate it enough. We don't talk about it enough. Maybe because we feel like it's bragging, I don't know. But what this church does is important. The voice of welcome and inclusion that goes out from this church is important. The lives that come close to despair that this church as a community of faith touch and bring back is important. There is story after story about how people in the community have been blessed because this church has been here. It's a shrewd way of doing business here at Park Hill Christian Church. For the children of this age are more shrewd in their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Brad, thank you. And I want to thank you personally. I know this is our second to the last opportunity to hear you speak. But it's the last Sunday we'll have Jill with us. She'll not be able to be with us next week. So, Jill, I want you to know, thank you for marrying this man so he could end up being ha giving us this gift. I thank her too. Exactly. <laughs> but thank you especially. We've stretched and we've grown. We've come closer to God, and honestly, we've been convicted on more than one Sunday, if you're anything like me. So thank you. And as we prepare to sing our next song, Blessed Assurance, there is a blessed assurance that comes from Christ as your Savior. And if this is a time for you to accept Him for the first time, or the thousandth, let us all recommit ourselves to Christ today. In the only way we know, just as we are. And if you are looking for a church home, we would love to have you. Let's continue with blessed assurance. As Billy said, our hymn of commitment is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. That's number 334 in your blue hymnal. We're going to sing verses 1 and 3. If you will, please stand and sing with us. This is 
to whom great gifts are given. Let us take these gifts of God into the world. Let us remember the poor and the least, and especially the lost. To God's glory, let our work this week spread his hope and his peace.